Thank you so much, David Corton. And now we welcome David Barsamian. Thank you very much. Uh, it's wonderful to be here with you this evening. Thank you for turning out and supporting uh, Yes! magazine, celebrating its 10th anniversary and Reclaim the Media. Uh, these are really two positive responses, concrete, uh, not abstract, something that's right here in your community that you can have an impact on, you can participate in. So, um, you know, kudos to Yes! for celebrating 10 years and Reclaim the Media for providing some alternatives uh, to corporate control of the media. Uh, there's a must-see documentary made by a brilliant young Egyptian-American woman, uh, Jahan Nujam. It's called Control Room. And in the, it's about Al Jazeera, the Arabic language 24-hour satellite service. Would we have such an independent service here in the United States? We desperately need one. Uh, one just started in Caracas, uh, under the aegis of uh, Hugo Chavez, called Telesur, that is presenting news and information uh, from the bottom up, not from the corporate suites, but from the perspectives and the vision of the people in the streets. And we have to work towards that. And I think another world is not only possible, it's absolutely uh, essential, as uh, David Corton very eloquently uh, described. Uh, time is not on our side. This is a time of opportunity, but the coming crises are uh, coming ever so closer, and that iceberg that you see uh, in, you know, in, on the horizon is not only melting um, because of uh, climate change, but it's, it's coming very close to uh, you know, hitting the ship. So it is a moment of, of opportunity. I think uh, there's the uh, Chinese word for uh, crisis has the uh, characters of um, uh, danger as well as opportunity. So we must be thinking in terms of you know, seizing the time and, and the opportunity before us. In this documentary uh, about Al Jazeera, the opening scene features uh, Samir uh, Khadr. He is a senior uh, producer at Al Jazeera. He's an Iraqi, uh, by the way. And he says, to make a war, you need propaganda, and to make propaganda, you need a media. And the Americans have the media. And uh, you'll see in the, in the film uh, how propaganda is skillfully used to manufacture consent and to manipulate uh, public opinion. Uh, fortunately, there has been a counter-movement toward uh, the corporate media. There are now five corporations that basically uh, control everything we see, hear, and read uh, in the United States. Uh, that's AOL, Time Warner, uh, it's uh, Disney, ABC, it's Fox News Corporation, it's Viacom, uh, CBS, and it's General Electric, a major military contractor uh, which, controls, uh, General, uh, which controls NBC. And so these five corporations co constitute what Ben Bagdikian calls a private ministry of information, and he thinks that there is no more powerful force in shaping the public mind. He wrote about that maybe 25 years ago. But s parallel with the growth and increasing monopoly control and concentration, uh, there has been a huge surge in independent media. Uh, yes Magazine and Reclaim the Media are just two examples. Uh, the project I started uh, 20 years ago uh, is another example. Uh, you have the uh, remarkable uh, success of Amy Goodman's Democracy Now!, uh, a program which you can hear. A program which you can hear uh, in Seattle uh, on the Bellevue Community College Station, uh, not once, but twice a day. This program began in 1996 uh, on five radio stations. It was a temporary program. It was created just for that election cycle, and after the November election, it was going to dissolve. Uh, there was such demand for it to continue uh, that uh, Pacifica uh, decided to uh, keep it going. It is now on over 400 radio and TV stations around the world. And that's, that is a, an enormous uh, breakthrough, and it's just one of the many 
examples of our creating our own media. As, as David said, ultimately, we have to control our own cameras and our own microphones. We can't completely depend on the corporate media to cover our stories. If they do, it will be through their uh, very narrow framework and spectrum of opinion. So creating an independent media is absolutely essential to rolling back imperialism and, and empire. Uh, imperialism requires an imperial media. It cannot breathe without it, the media. And we've seen that with the manipulation and control over Afghanistan, the reporting over Iraq, and now the same propaganda onslaught uh, to whip up frenzy to launch a war against uh, Iran. There have been tremendous breakthroughs in a variety of fronts that really are exciting and encouraging and it's mostly young people that are doing this work which is you know I, you know so so uh, important there's been uh, a, just a surge in new documentary films uh, uncovered I mentioned uh, the one about Al Jazeera uh, control room there's a fantastic film about uh, the CIA-led coup in Venezuela called The Revolution Will Not Be Televised. There's Fog of War. Uh, there's Super Size Me, Shocking and Awful, 9-11 Hijacking Catastrophe, uh, Peace Propaganda and the Promised Land, Walmart, uh, Out Fox, Why We Fight, a new film uh, that just came out in the last uh, few months and that really speaks to this uh, t-shirt that I'm wearing. I don't know if you could see it. It says, Stop the War Machine. And on the back of it, it says, Ike was right. Um, I had to explain to uh, someone at Evergreen College yesterday uh, who Ike was. a two-time Republican president of the United States, a f um, commander of all allied forces in Europe during World War II. He led the Normandy invasion on June 6, 1944, president of Columbia University. And he is the focus of a remarkable documentary, I think, that is very skillful for selecting Eisenhower as the, the means to get across a message about militarism and imperialism because, because of who Eisenhower is and his uh, credentials. Of course, it was Eisenhower on January 17, 1961, as he was exiting the White House and as the brave, new, dynamic, liberal John F. Kennedy was coming in, it was Eisenhower that talked about the, quote, the immense military establishment and large arms industry. And he said prophetically, in the councils of government, we must guard against the acquisition of unwant unwarranted influence by the military industrial complex. The potential for the disastrous rise of misplaced power exists and will persist. He also said, I think that the people want peace so much that one of these days governments had better get out of the way and let them have it. Every gun that is made, every warship launched, every rocket fired signifies in the final sense a theft from those who hunger and those who are cold and not clothed. So this is, uh, you know, I think a, an excellent tool in terms of education. So another world is possible, not just in the media, but also politically. And we can draw a lot of inspiration and encouragement from Latin America which is shaking under our feet. I don't know if you can feel the temblors, uh, but the entire continent has rejected the neoliberal global globalization model and has been establishing more democratic, people-responsive uh, governments throughout the continent. And it's not just uh, Hugo Chavez in Venezuela, but particularly uh, Evo Morales in Bolivia, who won a remarkable election uh, in uh, mid-December, the first time an indigenous person has been elected to the presidency of any 
uh, continental uh, Latin American uh, Republic, and Bolivia is an Indian majority uh, state, and it was in Bolivia where you had this enormous uprising, popular spontaneous uprising against Bechtel in Cochabamba a few years ago when Bechtel went in and in a deal with the corrupt Bolivian government, uh, they privatized the water in Cochabamba. Uh, immediately, there was a quintupled increase in the price of water, and people were out in the streets in their thousands, in their tens of thousands, and hundreds of thousands, and the pressure was so much on the uh, Bolivian government in La Paz that they had to renege on the deal with Bechtel and re-publicize, re-take back into the common good uh, the water resources of Cochabamba. Uh, there are th very interesting developments going on in Argentina, in Ecuador, in Uruguay, in Brazil, where uh, Lula was elected. There are popular movements such as Via Campesina and uh, Tierra Sin, um, Movimiento Sin Tierra. And these, these organizations uh, don't have the kind of resources that you know, many of us here uh, take for granted. Uh, not, you know, they don't have maybe DSLs and uh, laptop computers and the kind of connectivity uh, that we are so uh, addicted to. But they have grassroots organizing. They go door to door to find people who will join their movement. And I was uh, remembering uh, John Lewis talking about the 40th anniversary of the March on Washington in, um, and so this would be in 2003, and he said, you know, back then, I mean, it wasn't that long ago, you know, we didn't have cell phones, we didn't have email or computers, and we didn't even have answering machines on the telephone. You'd ring, you'd call someone, the phone would ring forever and ever, you could never leave a message. Nevertheless, through grassroots organizing, through um, institutions, through churches and local community organizations, they were able to mobilize this massive number of people uh, in, wa in Washington that had, of course, an enormous uh, impact and effect civil rights legislation and effectively ended apartheid, a def, a de jure apartheid in the United States. So if we think about uh, what's going on in, in countries that are much less privileged than ours, and I know Chomsky talks about this uh, wherever he goes when he talks to American audiences, and I, I find it also uh, quite uh, similar. People are asking, what can I do? What should I do? Uh, this is a question he observes that only occurs uh, in the United States, not when he or I go to Turkish Kurdistan and meet with human rights uh, organizers and activists. They tell us what they're doing. Or when we go to Pakistan and meet with uh, women who are defending women's rights there, they tell us what they are doing. So there's some disconnect here, there's some palito here that we need to ignite with all of our talent and all of our ability and uh, the possibilities and, and the resources that we command, what is it that's holding us back? I mean, I'm, I get that feeling that, you know, so we're just waiting, we're waiting for it to happen. So we've become spectators, we've become passive, and it's, it's so important to move from passivity to activity. And so what is that palito, as they say in southwestern Spanish, what is that kindling wood that it's going to take to make that spark? Are we waiting for a road of parks, uh, you know, not to sit in the back of the bus. Uh, we did have a, a similar moment, moment, I thought, when Cindy Sheehan went to Crawford, Texas and sat down in a ditch, uh, you know, kind of crystallizing uh, the peace movement and resistance to the war machine. But it seemed to, you know, it had its moments, but it didn't seem to galvanize uh, the mass of people. We've got lots of motions in the country, but we don't have a mass movement yet. Although it's very interesting, as we speak, uh, one of the largest civil rights movements uh, in the history of the United States is taking place right now and this has happened absolutely under the screen and the radar of not only the political elite who did totally did not expect it, but of the media as well. Somehow, there are networks of immigrants, uh, organizations, not just through the churches, but through other um, very loose-knit organizations around the country that has 
been able to uh, organize and to get out hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people, in not just the ones you heard about, not just uh, you know Los Angeles and New York and Chicago where you'd kind of expect it, but I'm telling, talking about you know North Carolina, South Carolina, Mississippi, Tennessee, uh, you know not exactly uh, places where there's a lot of uh, activity going on politically. So that's a very interesting development. How can we maybe possibly intersect uh, the peace movement, the justice movement, with uh, rights for uh, immigrants. So I think another world is not only possible, uh, it's absolutely happening. And I just want to close with the words of the great Arundhati Roy of India. She says, the corporate revolution will collapse if we refuse to buy what they are selling. Their ideas, their version of history, their wars, their weapons, their notion of inevitability. Remember this, we be many and they be few. They need us more than we need them. Another world is not only possible, she is on her way. And on a quiet day, if you listen very carefully, you can hear her breathing. Thank you very much.